Oh my gosh, it is an honor to be here. Thank you so much to Pastor Joe and Pastor Nancy for believing in me. Um, Pastor Nancy would be right. I actually did come here for all of high school. And this is such a full circle moment for me because one day I woke up and Caleb was on his phone. Caleb's my husband, if you don't know. And it was a Sunday and he's like, babe, I think we should go to this church, Trinity Church. And I'm like, you mean Trinity Church Dallas? And he's like, yeah, I just found it on Google. And I'm like, that was my church. And he's like, well, we should go. And I was like, okay, bet. You don't have to you know, twist my arm to make me go. And I show up here and I see Pastor Joe and I see all the people that I saw when I came here in high school. And it just brought back the best memories. This church is amazing. If you guys can't tell, like they usher in the presence of God, the Holy Spirit moves here. Like if you, if you can just feel it in that worship, you can feel it as Pastor Nancy is speaking. I mean, I feel like I don't even need to speak after her because she did it for all of us. I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm done. I can close my iPad now. But if you don't know who I am, yes, I am Janine Amapola, now Ward. I am a newlywed. Is, does eight months count as a newlywed still? Okay, thank you guys. Phew. I'm learning a lot, trust me. I'm learning a lot, and I'm a Christian podcaster. I'm a new author. It's weird saying that for me. I'm like, I'm an author. Um, and I speak now, which is also really cool. Uh, when I came here in high school, never in my life did I ever think I would be up here on this stage with the microphone. Like, why would Pastor Joe trust me with the microphone? I don't know. And I actually did. I used to dance down here. Um, I did the youth group ministry here. I sang back at, in the day and there. And I was just a little rascal, to be honest, <laughs> just a little rascal. But it's kind of ironic because this place healed a lot of my trauma. And now tonight, I might be healing yours. Can I get an amen? <laughs> okay, so I have a question for you guys. We're all women here with the exception of some men. Shout out Caleb. But who here as a woman is sometimes exhausted by being a woman? Okay, everyone. <laughs> because as a woman, there's so much pressure to look perfect, to get your hair this way, buy this product, retinol, Botox, skincare treatments, gua sha, lymphatic drainage. You got to get the little thing to get rid of the cellulite, which I'm like, does that thing actually even work? I don't even know. And um, I just feel exhausted by it all. I feel like I can't keep up. And then you buy one product, you're like, okay, I just got this, I got the gua sha, I got the lymphatic drainage, I got the thing, and then all of a sudden, it's just out. Like, the trend is out, the thing is gone, and you're like, wait, whoa, I just got acclimated and adjusted to that, and they're like, sorry, next, new product, and then you're like, oh, my bank account can't handle this. And honestly, for the sake of my marriage, I should probably get off TikTok, because packages keep showing up, and my poor husband keeps breaking them down for me. He's my professional boxer breaker downer, if that's a thing. <laughs> and so I feel like all these products are so, so expensive. Shout out to inflation for that. But the one thing that is free that I feel like all of us could channel and could have, and no matter what season it is, it never goes in, it never goes out, is godly character. Yeah. I love y'all already. Yes, we love a responsive crowd. I'm like, work with me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love Trinity Church for this reason. I've been to some churches where it's silence in the room. And I'm like sweating. I'm like, do you guys even like me? Like, I'll get off if you want. We love you. Thank you. I love you too. So godly character is never out. What is never out is our respect, our integrity, our worth, our passion for Jesus the way we love people, the way we pray, the way we use our mouths to praise people or to curse people, to bring life to people or to bring death to people. And in 1 Peter 3, 3 through 5, if you guys already know this verse, it's about, you know, the outward adornment. And I remember hearing this all growing up and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not about my outward appearance. But at the time I was insecure. I'm like, okay, just let me get New makeup products, okay? But as I've gotten older, I've gained more confidence in the Lord where I'm like, wow, this is, this is fun. Like, I love to do my hair. I love to do my makeup. But it is fleeting. I'm 30 now, and I am starting to see my face change. 
And I'm like, wait, whoa, where did my little baby fat go? And I'm starting to see my eyes sink more. And I'm like, oh, this is scary. But that all comes and goes. And as we read in 1 Peter 3, 3 through 5, it says that your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair or gold jewelry. Should I take my watch off? (laughs) Or fine clothes. But from the inner disposition of your heart, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in God's sight. For this is how the holy women of the past adorned themselves. They put their hope in God. That is something that is unfading. Trends come and go. All these things come and go. You buy this, it's out. You get this, it's out. But what is never changing is your character and the unfading beauty of your spirit. What if what is beauty all for if you dislike yourself and so do others? What is it all for? It's fleeting. So now I have another question for you guys, and I actually like genuinely want you guys to participate, okay? When was the last time that you genuinely felt fired up for God? Maybe it was like last week, okay, yes? Tonight? I love that, amen, thank God for that. Anyone else? Is a week ago, okay, yes? Oh, love that, Shoreline is a great church, Mondays at Shoreline. I love that you get weekly refreshment, that's amazing. Or when was the last time you genuinely felt in awe of who God is? Or when was the last time you prayed for a stranger? Or when was the last time that you shared the gospel? I want all of this for us because this is sowing a seed into something so much deeper than just ourselves. It's something eternal. We're building treasures in heaven that will never fade away. And again, a big part of my story was here at this church. I was just talking to Pastor Joe about this in the back. And in the beginning of January, they used to do like a 10-day fast, which was long. (laughs) You wouldn't eat for 10 days. I mean, you could. I cheated. Don't come for me. I would cheat. But I would do, you know, a good like 24-hour fast, 48-hour fast, and then I would tiptoe to the pantry and sneak a little cookie. I couldn't help myself, okay, guys? But... At this church is when I encountered the Holy Spirit for the first time. I mean, we would fast, we would pray, we would worship, we would cry. People would be down here falling on their face. They would be getting healed. Demons would be coming out of people. I mean, I was like, what is happening? Like, this is kind of scary. But I saw people leave different than the way they came. And that is what I want for all of us. I I miss that. I feel absent of that in my life today, and I don't understand why that is. Because God hasn't changed. The Bible hasn't changed. I've changed. Culture has changed. Society has changed. And I feel like a lot of us walk around numb or absent of his power, of his Holy Spirit, when it is fully available to us. But many people and places don't embrace it. And I want us to be people that embrace it. Today, I want to challenge us women, and I guess some men in here, to rise up. We were made for such a time as this. To be known for more than our beauty and our style and our appearance, but for who God made us to be. Today, I want to share with you guys four things that God strongly desires for us to be all he has called us to be. So if you brought your Bible, I will be in Acts 19. And I just want to open us up in prayer because it would be doing us a disservice if I didn't. (sighs) Holy Spirit, we just invite you into this place, Lord. We welcome you. You are so, so welcome here, Jesus. This has nothing to do with me, but everything to do with you, Jesus. God, I pray that chains are broken tonight. I pray that people that have been carrying things for decades will find freedom in this room tonight. 
I pray someone that walked in here not feeling beautiful feels beautiful tonight. God, we just welcome you. Teach us your word. Anoint this room. Bless these people and help them see who you are and all that we were meant to be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so I'm just gonna read today out of Acts 19. It is a long one, so buckle up. But if you don't have your Bible, I have it on the screen here for you guys. And I honestly have a big fear of reading out loud, so don't make fun of me if I mess up. <laughs> okay, so we're starting in verse one. It is Acts 19, and let me just tell you guys, when I was reading this, I had a completely different message prepared for tonight, and I was just flipping through the Bible, and I stumbled across this, and I was wrecked. I mean, this is so good. There's so much meat in it, and when you read really fast, you're kind of like, okay, cool, like not maybe seeing what you're seeing. We'll get into it, but it's really, really rich. Okay, so in verse one, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the, other, he told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. They were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate and they refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. The way is Jesus. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and they had discussions daily on the lecture hall of Tyrannus. They went on for two years so that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews went around driving out evil spirits, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a, Jew, a Jewish priest were, priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirits answered them and said, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out the house naked and bleeding, which is just kind of crazy. <laughs> And when, they, when this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, but, and the name of the Lord of Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done, a number who had practiced sorcery threw their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, they, the total came to 50,000 dramshas? I don't know, y'all. Give me a break on that one. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Okay, I just think this is like so amazing because we see here, and originally in Acts 2 and Acts, this is when we first get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes, he breaks out in the upper, upper room and people are just encountering Jesus in mighty ways that they never had before because Jesus had ascended back into heaven and he said, hey, I'm leaving my Holy Spirit with you. And so that's what happens. Now the Holy Spirit comes and breaks out. But I read this and I'm like, there's four things I notice in this chapter that I find to be really, really powerful. And as women of God and as the church and in society today, I just don't think we pursue nearly as much as we should. And while this story may be about Paul, it is not subjected just to Paul. This is for us. This Bible is for us. And we are called to emulate Jesus as well. So I wanna tell you guys about four things I notice here. Four things that God desires for us today to sow seeds not only just into ourselves but into the kingdom and into other people. The first thing that I noticed here was the Holy Spirit baptism. So we see here that Paul comes in and he lays his hands on people and the Holy Spirit breaks out. People begin to speak in tongues, they're prophesying and they're encountering Jesus in a way that they've never encountered before. 
A reaction happened because of just one touch with the Holy Spirit. And that can happen for you tonight. The Holy Spirit is essential in our lives. It is what convicts us, challenges us, calls us higher. It's that gentle nudge where you're like, oh, I know I shouldn't be doing this. And God's like, I see you. <laughs> I got something better for you. But he speaks to us. And if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then why is he not the God of right now? Amen. Why do we not believe that we could still do this? Why do we think that our Bible is shut and it's only active when we read it in the stories and it's not for us today? Because it is. And I think God wants more for us. I think God wants us to go deeper with him and encounter him in ways more than we ever have before. God wants us to rely on him every single day, not just when we need him. The Holy Spirit should be more like a daily vitamin than a crisis prescription. And I think a lot of us do that. When we're in trouble, or we've made the mistake, or we got back to the ex, or we looked at something we shouldn't have looked at, we overspent again, we overate, whatever the thing is for you, we're immediately like, God help me, God help me. And he's like, I've been helping you, but you've neglected me, or you chose your own way. And there's redemption, there's grace. But the Holy Spirit is something essential that guides us on our journey. It's those gentle nudges that tells you Bite your tongue, don't say that thing. Go up to that person, pray for someone today. Or maybe when you get woken up at 3 a.m. and you just don't know why, it's always 3 a.m., why I gotta be 3 a.m.? And you're like, I feel like I need to pray, or there's something stirring that I need to pray. That is the Holy Spirit. And it's like a muscle, honestly. The more that you activate the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, activate. The more you activate the Holy Spirit, the more it becomes available to you. And the more you spend time with God, the more his voice becomes familiar. Just like in John 10, 27, he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So the more you spend time with the Lord, the more you activate this Holy Spirit, the more you'll be able to identify what his voice sounds like and what his voice does not sound like. And let me remind you, his voice never speaks fear, ever. And maybe you've never encountered the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've never been in an environment where you've encountered him, or maybe it's a little weird for you or uncomfortable, or you're like, I don't know, that's for other people, not for me. I'll tell you guys a time that I encountered the Holy Spirit and it wasn't exactly what I thought it was gonna be. So I one time got invited to go to the middle of Louisiana. I don't know why it was there, but it just was. And this youth ministry brings me out to the middle of Louisiana. I go to this church and it, was, it seemed normal, it seemed fine. And everyone's worshiping and I was worshiping. I went with my sister, so at least I had like a safe person there for me. And at the very end, the pastor is like, hey, who here wants to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? And I swear, the whole state of Louisiana just comes rushing down. The whole state just floods the front, and it's just me and my sister standing there, and we're like, are we, are like, are we supposed to go down there? And I'm like, okay, we're the only ones here. This is kind of awkward. Okay, we're gonna go, we're gonna go. So we go down, and as I'm waiting in line, I'm like, I'm like kind of nervous. I'm like, what? Like, what is gonna happen? I've never like had this happen before. So I'm like waiting in line. I'm like really anxious. I'm like fidgeting around, and all of a sudden, people in front of me are just falling left and right. Like, pfft. Oh, Brandy, it's not what you think. It's not what you think, Brandy. It's not what you think. And I'm like, what kind of sorcery is this? Like, what, what is this guy doing? I don't know, it was uncomfortable. So I'm starting to get nervous. I'm like sweating and I'm like, okay, do I want to fall? Am I supposed to fall? Everyone's falling. Do I get a pillow? Should I stretch? Like, is there a safe landing for me? I don't know. So I get there and he lays his hand on me and he's like, I command you to be baptized in the name of the Holy Spirit. And he pushes me. And me being a stubborn little girl, I just stood there. And I just, I just stood there. And he pushed again. And that time I actually fell. Fell on the ground. And I'm literally like full on possum mode. And I'm frozen and I'm like, now what? Because other, other people, they were laying down and their eyes were closed and they were like, looked like they were in this like ethereal thing. And I'm just like laying there and I'm like, Is, am I dead? Am I in heaven? I'm not really sure like what's going on. And I didn't know what to do. I'm like, how long am I supposed to lay here? 
And so I just awkwardly like kind of got up and like tiptoed away, like not to disturb anyone else that genuinely probably felt that. It was like Oprah. He was like, you get a baptism and you get a baptism and people are just slain in the spirit. And I was like, I'm gonna just quietly leave, okay? It was, a, it was an interesting thing. But homie was pushing me and I was 12 years old and I feel like it should be illegal to push a 12 year old in your, in your church congregation. So if there's any lawyers here, I need to speak to you afterwards because I feel like there's a class action lawsuit coming. But I feel like the Holy Spirit shouldn't be weird like that. I feel like the Holy Spirit should be genuine and authentic, and it cannot be something that's manipulated because it's not you, it's not your power. It has everything to do with him and nothing to do with you. But you, the way that you participate is you come with an open heart and an open mind and you say, Holy Spirit, I welcome you. And it changes you. I remember when I encountered the Holy Spirit here, it changed me. I left different than the way I came. I was never the same. And to be quite frank, I was struggling with an addiction. I had an addiction for many, many, many years that I've opened up about in my book. And I found freedom here in this place because this church welcomed the Holy Spirit. So when we look in scripture, like they welcome the Holy Spirit and it changed people. And I want us to be people that are not afraid of the Holy Spirit. We're not afraid of a move of God. We're not just comfortable in our box. We don't just go to church and have our hands in our pants and we're just like, okay, I'm just gonna do my routine, check the box. He wants more for you. And he changes you. And it's not only in church environments. It's in your bedroom. It's in your living room. It's in your car. You get the access to channel the Holy Spirit whenever you want because if you are a believer, he lives inside of you. It's a free gift and thank you, Jesus, for that. And I want us to be spiritful people, people who carry the presence of God because when we carry it, it changes other people. And everything we do should be for other people. Okay, the next thing that I noticed in this chapter is repentance and confession. In verse eight, it says, many of those who believe now came openly and confessed what they had done. When was the last time that you confessed? It's kind of awkward, right? You're like, so I kind of did a thing again. Please don't judge me. And your friend, your friend's like, okay, you know, I thought we were done with that. I'm kidding. Your friend should not judge you. That's a bad friend, bad friend. But is this a lost art? Like, are we grieved when we break God's heart? Because sin breaks God's heart. It's not what he intended for us. And it actually separates us from him. But when we confess and when we repent, It's turning the other way and saying, God, I'm done with that. And yes, you may be tempted and you may struggle again, but it's saying, God, I'm so sick and tired of being sick and tired of that same thing, bringing me back over and over and over and over. But confession creates intimacy with God. And it also brings you freedom. Praise God for that. That there's a free tool just by opening your mouth that sets you free. And it seems so scary. Like the buildup is always the worst thing ever. You're like in your car and you're like, okay, I know I need to call my friend. I need to tell them what I did. I went back to my ex. You know who you are? I'm just kidding. No judgment here. And then you're like, okay, I'm gonna call my best friend. I'm gonna tell her, I'm gonna tell her. But the buildup is always worse than the actual action of doing it. And once you do it, you're like, oh, that wasn't that bad. I feel free. That was great. Confession and repentance are not check boxes that we do but it's a habit that we will build for the rest of our lives. Because in different seasons, we have different struggles. And so this is a habit that I think that God wants us to exercise to where it doesn't even become like you think twice about it. It's just like, yeah, I know, I gotta confess. I had a thought last night, I need to confess. Last night, I was struggling. I went to my best friend, I went to my husband, and I said, hey, I'm feeling really insecure. I feel underqualified. I feel like I should not be here on this stage. I feel like I am believing lies from the enemy. And they prayed for me. And I was free. And I felt good again. Paul Washer says, and buckle up because this is pretty convicting. It convicted me. Paul Washer says, a true Christian will be sensitive to the sin in their life and it'll lead them to brokenness and a genuine confession. But the person who says that they are a Christian and are not sensitive to sin, it does not lead them to confession. 
A person who is that way is not a Christian. Pretty convicting. Sin should make you sick. And it does make you sick. It causes you to dwindle. Your spirits start to decay. People start to see you're acting different. Are you okay? And it decays your spirit. And I want us to be people that are sensitive to sin. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says that godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. When you come to God, there's no shame, there's no regret, nothing but freedom. But worldly sorrow brings death. Worldly sorrow is thinking, I'm just gonna lock this in, no one needs to know, I'm not gonna tell a single soul, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. And then you start to see your spirit decay. That's not what God intended for you. So as you're sitting here right now, is there anything that you can think of that you would need to confess? Anything that you can think of that you would need to be repented of? And you can write it down. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to pray about this later tonight. But ultimately, I want you guys to make this a habit where you go to your people and you go to your peers and you confess. And again, it changes us. I want us to be women of God who are not entangled by sin, but set free by the act of courage to confess whatever enslaves us. Because here's the truth. Confess people are free people. And free women, free other women. The only reason why I'm here on stage is because God freed me. Pastor Nancy, she alluded to me walking away from my faith just a little bit. I came back. But there was a season where I was not faithful with God. I did whatever my little heart desired. And where did that leave me? Full of shame, regret, guilt, disappointment. Just like, God, how did I get here? But man, he lovingly and gently welcomed me back home. And by him setting me free, I'm able to set other people free through the Holy Spirit inside of me. Okay, the third gift that I noticed that I wanna talk about is the gift of the Spirit for us and others. So we see here that God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. So Paul had a gift. Paul had a gift to heal, Paul had a gift to minister, Paul had a, a gift to preach, and Paul knew his gifts. But he didn't just like sit in his house and be like, hey, this is just for me. I'm just gonna sit here and do my little thing in my house. No, he used his gifts that God gave him to set other people free. And beautiful women, you all have a gift. Not one of us here doesn't have a gift. Every single one of you has a gift. And I just want you guys to walk into that and maybe you don't know what that is. Get around other believers that affirm you and they see gifts in you. I see that you have the gift of encouragement. I see you have the gift of tongues. I see you have the gift of hospitality. I see you have the gift of healing. I see you have the gift of just edifying the body of Christ. Whatever it is, you have a gift. And your gift is not for you to hoard. Your gift is for you to share with the world. Because again, people get set free by your presence, which is Jesus inside of you. And I'll confess, I've, I've read this, and I was like, when did I stop believing that prophecy happens, or miracles happen, or healing happens, or tongues happen when someone lays hands on me? And this is the real version of laying hands on somebody. Not falsely pushing someone down, but actually having power invested by the Holy Spirit to somebody to where that changes somebody. But when did I stop believing that? Because God hasn't stopped healing. I've just stopped laying my hands. And I want us to be people that when we walk around, we see someone hurting, someone is injured, someone is going through something that we immediately stop and say, let's lay hands right now. And honestly, this was so beautiful. I was just in the back and I've been having horrible back pain like this last whole week and I came here and some of the women here literally just were like, hey, let's lay hands, let's pray right now, let's lay hands. And let me tell you, my back feels great. So thank you to those beautiful women that did that for me because I feel awesome right now. And earlier, I literally came in here feeling crippled, like it was crazy. But I want us to be women that see a need and then we fill it. Again, this has nothing to do with our appearance, but everything to do with our hearts. 
And even in this verse later, the demon says, Jesus, I know you. Paul, I know you. But who are you? The demons said they knew who Jesus was. The demons should not know Jesus more than we do. That's like kind of a sobering thought. Because we should walk into a room with the Holy Spirit inside of us and we should make demons shudder. They should be terrified of you. When that 3 a.m. thing strikes, when you wake up at 3 a.m. and you say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus and that thing flees, it has to leave. It has to. Because you carry the Holy Spirit. There's no need to be scared of demons because you have authority in you to rebuke them. The last thing that I noticed in this, and I just found it to be so, so beautiful, is the fourth thing is that these people came and they removed any idols in their life and any sins. And they openly did this in front of everybody. It says here that a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Their boldness to go first, to say, I'm gonna burn this. This thing has enslaved me for way too long. I've been leaving a false God. I've been worshiping a false idol. Today is the day that I burn this. And by them going first and their courage, it led other people to do the same. And I want you again to think in your life, because all of us have idols, but what is your idol? Is it money? Is it your looks, your relationship status, followers, your job title, sorority title, golf for my husband? (laughs) We'll talk about that later. And I'm not going to ask you to burn anything here because I don't want to get into a lawsuit and I don't know what Pastor Nancy's fire insurance looks like. But I am gonna ask you in your minds or even tonight to think of something that maybe you've been worshiping just a little too much. And it wakes you up in the middle of the night or you think about it all day long, it's all your brain can think of. That might be an idol in your life. And Tim Keller, rest in peace, we love him. Tim Keller says, an idol is something that we look to for things that only God can give. Like I want us to figuratively think in our minds or imagine, God, what am I giving way too much power in my life, more than you? And I do believe as human beings, we're mere human beings. This is something we'll struggle with probably for the rest of our lives, but it's that daily act of confession, daily act of repentance, daily act of Holy Spirit, convict me of maybe something in my life that I'm giving way too much power to. And later on, we go here into the verse, and it says, in and the name of the Lord was held in high honor. Is the name of the Lord held in such high honor in your life that there's no room for anything else? There's no room for anything else because God is the only thing that you want to serve, and you want to serve him only. (sighs) I remember the beginning of my journey of social media, So I've been doing this for a very long time. I didn't start sharing my faith online publicly. I was first doing like beauty and fashion videos and it was really fun and innocent. And there came a time in my life where the the Holy Spirit just wrecked me like in the best way possible. And I started to feel compelled to share my faith and it was like really uncomfortable for me in the beginning. Because people started to be like, ew, like we don't wanna hear about this. I wanna see your morning routine. I wanna know your skincare secrets. I don't want to know about like what you're reading in the Bible. And people started to unfollow me. Like they literally were like, I don't want to hear about your faith. You're shoving your faith on me. And I was like, I'm just reading the Bible. Like, I don't know, I'm shoving it on you. But I was putting people pleasing as my idol. I put my followers as my idol. This was my idol. And people pleasing is still a struggle for me today because I'm going to be transparent and go first. It is still a struggle for me today. But I want us to be people that only live for the audience of one, and that would be God. So even if my social media tanks and everybody unfollows me, God still calls me blessed and highly favored. Can I get an amen? (laughs) That's right. Okay, women of God, how 
do we do this? How do we do this? In Acts 20, 20, 24, it says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the ass that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task to testify the good news. That should be our main mission in life. Don't lose sight. Don't lose sight of that. Because one day we're all gonna stand before God and I want him to say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. So how do we do this? We number one, we desperately hunger for God and we ask more of him because he is worth it. Number two, we put ourselves in environments just like this one that welcomes the Holy Spirit. Number three, we seek the uncomfortable because sometimes seeking God is uncomfortable. But again, it is always worth it. Number four, we lead by example. Sometimes someone needs just you to be the person that goes first and says, I'll go first. I'll confess first. I'll go worship first. I'll raise my hands first. I'll bow right here first. I will say yes first. And by your boldness and by your courage, other women are following behind you. Women that you don't even know are following behind you. Women that have maybe admired you for years, they're watching you and looking to you to say, yes, God, I will go first. Number five, we use our gifts to bless other people. Number six, we stand firm in our convictions, even if no one else does. And number seven, we invest into our spirits as that invests into the kingdom, which is eternal and not fleeting. Women of God, rise up. Women of God, rise up. You were made for more. You were made for more than just a touch point here and there with God, with an occasional devotional, with a Sunday service once here and there, or a conference here and there. You were made for more than mediocre, more, for than, more than subpar. God has more in store for you, and tonight might be the, the night where you encounter him for the first time. And it might freak you out, but it's gonna change you. Welcome it, usher it in. Because we too can witness and usher in radical acts of God, radical miracles of God with our bold faith. Be the, uh, the person who ushers in the presence of God. Be the person who prays for someone when no one else will. Be the person who notices someone when no one else does. Be the person who brings hope and encouragement to a friend group when everyone else is bringing gossip. This event is called Beautiful Night, and I love that theme because everyone here is so beautiful. But I want the most beautiful thing to be about us is our spirits. Let's be women who rise up to be bold for God, even if no one else will, because that is how we change the world. I'm going to pray for us. Thank you, Jesus. We just welcome your presence here, Lord. We welcome your presence here, Jesus. You are so, so welcome here, Jesus. The name above all names. You are so worthy, Jesus. Abba, Father, Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh, we thank you, Jesus, that you are who sets us free. Lord, you know all the struggles, all the insecurities, all the doubts, all the things that these women are coming in here and they're bringing. They're like, I've tried, I've tried in my own strength to follow you. I keep falling short, I keep struggling, I can't do this on my own anymore. And you can't. Lord, would you just be the Lord of their life? Would you convict women right now? And if anybody wants to come forward and if you wanna get prayer, we're gonna have people here in the front who are gonna pray over you. If you feel compelled, you need prayer, if there's something that's entangling you, something you keep going back to, something that is in your mind right now, you can be free. Leave it at Jesus' feet. 
Lord, we just ask for your convicting spirit to come in today, God, and to bless these women, to let them know that they were made for such a time as this. God, I ask for addictions to leave right now in the name of Jesus. I ask, God, for broken families to be fixed right now in the name of Jesus. God, I ask for healing. If someone here has an injury or something in their body that does not align with your word, God, I ask for healing right now in the name of Jesus. God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would move. You are so welcome here. God, I, I pray and ask that you would touch people right now. Maybe someone's been desperate for you, desperate for you, Jesus. They've been longing for you and they're just not feeling you. God, touch them right now in this room. Give them just a glimpse of your beauty because you're so beautiful. You're so worthy of worship in the name of Jesus. So we invite you, God. Amen. Let's worship, guys.